Good afternoon all from Silvana Pavlovska. This afternoon we're going to continue with the second part of the PRESPA agreement as cultural genocide of the Macedonian national identity towards uh, the termination of an illegal treaty. A paper consisting of almost 400 pages, research paper that is, by Professor Dr. Igor Yanev. This publication was first published in 2023. So it's only been a few months since it came out. And I have the great pleasure and also I'm very grateful to be able to share this publication with you, particularly in the English language. Please do bear with me as there's quite a bit of material to cover and I'm going to continue today with the chapter two. Chapter 2 is titled Responsibility of United Nations for Acts Involving Their Legal Personality in Relations with Member States. Two, one. Legal responsibility of the United Nations in general cases relevant to Macedonian irregular admission to the United Nations. Mm -hmm. The question of legal responsibility of international organizations for their illegal acts has been subject of discussions among legal scholars since the 40s and the 50s. The main interest has been focused on the legal effects of such acts and the possibilities of their judicial redress. In absence of a developed legal practice in the area of international institutional life, the discussions on this subject had in the past a predominantly institutional, uh, uh, doctrinarial, <laughs> I beg your pardon, doctrinarian character. So I'll just repeat this sentence again so we're certain. In addition, uh, in absence of a developed legal practice in the area of international institutional life, the discussions on the subjects had in the past a predominantly doctrinarian character. With the lapse of time, accumulation of a considerable body of relevant legal practice took place during the last five decades, which, coupled with the development and consolidation of certain legal concepts of international law, such as the legal personality of international organizations, etc., laid the foundations for development of, of a fairly consistent theoretical framework for the treatment and redress of the illegal acts of international organizations. An international organization as an international legal person derives its powers explicitly expressed or implied from its constitutional source and it's bound to act only within the limits and in accordance with the terms of the grant made to it by its members. The most obvious illegal acts that an organization can commit in exercising its powers and functions are breach of the constitutional provisions, example, by exceeding its powers, error in the interpretation of constitutional provisions, assertions of competence by an incompetent organ, improper exercise of a discretion on the basis of inaccurate or incomplete knowledge, all for wrong reasons or motives. Implementation of a decision adopted by a majority, but inconsistent with the constitutional provisions, 
suspension or expulsion from the organization in absence of proper jurisdiction, wrongful appointment of expenses among the members, breach of the staff rules and regulations, and so on. Unless there are specific provisions in the constitutional instrument of the organization, such as in the case of European communities, the effects of the illegal acts of the organization are governed by the general principles and practice of international law. The United Nations organization possesses an international legal personality and the capacity to bring international claims. But the UN Charter does not contain provisions which explicitly address the question of its responsibility for unlawful acts of its organs and the judicial redress of their consequences. The judicial responsibility of the United Nations Organization for its acts is, however, a correlative, um, correlative of its legal personality. Chap uh, Charter um, uh, ART 104, ART or Article 105, and the capacity to present international claims. In the well-known Riparation case, Riparation case, the International Court of Justice, affirming the international legal personality of the United Nations Organization, pointed out that the rights and duties of an entity such as the UN organization must depend upon its purposes and functions as specified or implied in its constituent documents and developed in practice, thereby affirming that this organization has certain duties related to its purposes and functions. Although the International Court of Justice may, according to Article 65, uh, paragraph one of its statute, give an advisory opinion on any legal question uh, at the request of the General Assembly and Security Council and of any UN organ or specialized agency within the United Nations system upon authorization by the General Assembly, Article 96 of the Charter, the court still does not have any judicial control over the legal effects of the acts of the organization. The advisory opinions of the court have no binding power themselves, but may be and normally are accepted by the organs requesting them as they induce, in quotation, moral consequences which are inherent in the dignity of the organ delivering them, end of quote. Exception to this rule is the General Convention on the Privileges and Immunities of the United Nations of 1946, which provides that the opinion given by the court upon the request of the organization regarding differences which could arise between the organization and a signatory state shall be binding to the parties. In the advisory jurisdiction of the court, there have been only a few cases in which the relations of United Nations with the states have been involved. In the reparation or reparation and Mazilu cases, the request for an advisory opinion was initiated and brought to the court by the organization. In the IMCO and certain expenses cases, the request for court's opinion was initiated by the member states of the IMCO and the UN respectively. For the purposes of our further discussions, we shall outline some of the characteristic features of these and, a, and um, a two other cases, says Professor Dr. Igor Yanev. The IMCO case is illustrative in several aspects. It is the first case in the history of international organizations and the court itself when the court was requested to give its opinion on a question of breach of a constitutional document, the Convention for the Establishment of IMCO, made by the plenary organ, the Assembly of the IMCO of the organization. Another feature of this case is that the question on legality of the committed act, the election of 
the Maritime Safety Committee at the first session of the IMCO Assembly in 1959 was put before the court by the IMCO Assembly itself, authorized by the UN General Assembly for such an action on request by two member states of the organization, Liberia and Panama, who contended that in the course of the elections, their constitutional rights have been violated namely to be automatically elected in the committee membership in accordance with the prescribed criteria in Article 28 of the IMCO convention, which they have been fulfilling. What happened was that during the elections, most of the voting members of the organization have taken as a basis for their vote additional criteria not expressly provided for in Article 28 of the Convention, to which they have attached a greater relevance than to those laid down explicitly in that article. The court delivered the opinion that the Maritime Safety Committee of IMCO, which was elected on January the 15th, 1959, was not constituted in accordance with the Constitution for the establishment of the organization. The above opinion of the court has been accepted by the IMCO Assembly at its next session. The Assembly resolved that the previously elected committee should be dissolved and decided, quotation, to constitute a new Maritime Safety Committee in accordance with Article 28 of the Convention as interpreted by the International Court of Justice and its advisory opinion. The Assembly also decided to confirm and adopt the measures which have been taken by the previously elected committee in the period 1959 to 1961 between the two Assembly sessions. Without going into more subtle analysis of the IMCO case, we would like to point out the identity of the character of the illegal act, breach of a procedural constitutional provision by the plenary organ of the organization in the IMCO case with the Macedonian admission to the United Nations membership. As we shall see later on, the legal consequences in the Macedonian case are, however, much, much more complex, says Professor Dr. Igor Yanev in his paper, The Prespa Agreement as Cultural Genocide of the Macedonian National Identity Towards the Termination of an Illegal Treaty a research paper published in 2023. Nevertheless, the IMCO case may serve as a model for ju judicial redress of the Macedonian case as well. In the certain expenses case, the question put before the International Court of Justice resulted from the largely divided views of the United Nations members regarding the constitutional basis of the expenditures authorized by a number of UN General Assembly resolutions for the operation of the UN Emergency Force, UNEF in the Middle East, and for the United Nations operations in the Congo, ONUC. In the latter case, ONUC, the GA resolutions were undertaken undertaken in pursuance of the corresponding Security Council resolutions. The division of the UN members in this case was essentially related to the question of legality of the mentioned operations under the terms of the UN Charter, that is, regarding the validity of corresponding UNGA resolutions. The request for the court's opinion took the form of whether these expenditures constituted, in quotation, expenses of the organization end of quote, within the meaning of Article 17, Paragraph 2 of the UN Charter. The court's opinion was given in the affirmative and was based on arguments that the decisions of the General Assembly regarding incurring expenditures for the above operations, having an observational character, are made in accordance with the mission of the United Nations for the maintenance of world peace and security, that the General Assembly is authorized to consider such expenditures as part of the expended regular budget of the UN and in accordance with Article 17, Paragraph 2, to apportion them to the member states as an obligation. The case illustrates that the decisions of the General Assembly 
that are of binding nature represents acts of the organization. According to Article 18 of the UN Charter, such acts of binding nature of the General Assembly are related to the budget of the organization and to the legal status of its members, that is, admission, suspension, and expulsion of members. In order to further elucidate the relationship between the legal responsibility of the United Nations Organization and the legal status of its members, we shall briefly outline the earlier mentioned Reparation case. The question put before the International Court of Justice in the United Nations, General Assembly's request for, so I beg your pardon, the question put before the International Court of Justice in the UN General Assembly's request for advisory opinion was whether the United Nations, as an organization, has the capacity to bring an international claim against the state responsible for the injuries suffered by an agent of the organization in the performance of its duties with a view to obtaining reparation due in respect to the damage caused, A, to the United Nations, and B, to the victim, or to persons entitled through him. In the derivation of its affirmative response to these questions, the court first established that the UN organization possesses international legal personality, necessary for discharging its functions and duties on the international plane, that the charter defines the position of the member states in relation to the organization, requiring their assistance in the discharge of organization's functions, Article 2, Paragraph 5, acceptance to carry out its decisions and those of the Security Council and giving the organization the necessary privileges in and immunities on their territories, Articles 104 and 105, and that the rights and duties of the organization are closely related to its functions and purposes as specified or implied in the Charter. From the facts that the question of the capacity of the UN organization to bring an international claim against a member state was put in the context of the legal liability of that state to pay reparations and that the court's opinion was given in the affirmative, it follows that the Charter is an international treaty to which the organization effectively is a party and which by defining the mutual rights and responsibilities of the parties, establishes a contractual relationship between them. This is further reinforced by the fact that in deriving its opinion, the court also invoked the General Convention on the Privileges and Immunities of the United Nations, which in an explicit way establishes the rights, duties, and mutual responsibilities between the signatories, that is the member states and the organization, and even defines section 30 of article eight, the mode of judicial settlement of the disputes between the different parties by an ICJ advisory opinion of binding character. It can be concluded that both the Charter and the Convention on Privileges and Immunities establish a relationship between the legal responsibility and the legal status of the international persons involved, the organization and the member states. As we have seen, this relationship is of a contractual nature and must involve the juridical li liabilities of the parties involved. The Mazilu case provides a typical example when the legal status of the UN organization, as represented by one of its agents, is violated by a member state. In performing his duties on an UN ECO SOC mission, Mr. Mazilu was deprived from his privileges and immunities by Romania, and ECO SOC requested the Court of an Advisory for an advisory opinion regarding the applica applicability of Article 6, Section 22 of the Convention on the Privileges and Immunities of the United Nations in the case of Mr. Mazilu. Despite the official objection, that is non-consent, of Romania for present, pre presenting the request to the court, the court has considered the case and delivered its opinion in the affirmative. 
being requested pursuant to Article 96, Paragraph 2 of the UN Charter and not under and not under Section 30 of Article 8 of the Convention to which Romania has expressed reservation during its accession to the Convention, the Court's opinion could not have a binding force. As noted earlier, Section 30 of Article 8 of this Convention provides a mechanism for settlement of the disputes between the organization and the signatories of the Convention via a binding advisory opinion of the Court on matters related to the legal status of the parties. The effects of a wards case is an example when the organization was found liable for violating the legal status of staff members of the organization. The question put before the court by the General Assembly was to inquire whether there is a legal ground, any legal ground, for refusing to give effect to an, to an award of compensation made by the United Nations Administrative Tribunal in favor of a UN staff member whose contract of service has been terminated without his assent. The court's opinion was given in the negative. This opinion was based on the arguments that a contract of service concluded between a staff member and the UN Secretary General acting on behalf of the organization engages the legal responsibility of the organization as a judicial person with respect to the other party and that in accordance with Article 10 of the Tribunal Statute, the judgment of the Tribunal is binding to the parties, final and without appeal. This case illustrates that when the organization violates the legal status of its elements, including that of its staff members as defined by the contract of service, the organization becomes responsible as a legal person. Since the UN Charter possesses also features of contractual character, character through which the organization appears as a party, particularly in matters related to the legal status of its members, in other words, since the legal status of both the organization and its member is of contractual origin, it can be concluded that the violation of any aspect of the legal status of either of them by the other leads to a legal responsibility of former and involves their legal personalities. These features are particularly important for understanding legal responsibility of UN organization in the case of derogation of the legal status of Macedonia in UN membership. From the above briefly analyzed cases on which the ICJ has given its opinion, several conclusions can be drawn. One, in discharging its constitutional functions, the UN organization has both rights and duties expressed in and derived from the constitutional provisions and has a legal responsibility for their lawful implementation. Two, the UN Charter, Charter as a multilateral treaty enables the organization with an international legal personality for carrying out its duties and functions and in the matters that involve the relations of the organization as a legal person with its members, it acquires features of contractual character, engaging the liability of the parties. Three, breaches of constitutional provisions by the plenary organ of the organization related to the rights and legal status of its members represent unlawful acts of the organization with respect to another international person for which the organization is legally responsible. And four, for violations by the organization of the constitutional provisions, particularly the rights related to the legal status of its member states, the advisory opinion of the International Court of Justice may serve as an instrument for settlement of the disputes as exemplified by the IMCO and effects of award cases. Two, two. The unlawful character of the admission of Macedonia to UN membership and advisory jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice. 
As mentioned in the previous discussion, Macedonia has been admitted to UN membership by the General Assembly Resolution 47-225-1993, subject to acceptance one, to be referred with the provisional name, quotation, the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia for all purposes within the United Nations, that is locally for organization purposes. And two, to negotiate with Greece over its name, not specified, but presumably erga omnes. These two unusual required conditions placed under take it or leave it process for admission of Macedonia to UN membership were additional with respect to those general laid down explicitly in Article 4, Paragraph 1 of the Charter, which the recommended SC Resolution 817-1993 recognizes to be fulfilled by the applicant. In characterizing the legality of the imposition of the above two conditions to the applicant as demands of type conditio sine qua non, for effecting its admission to UN membership, that is, as a price to pay for the UN status, in our research, particularly in the previous chapter one, we've already read that to you, three questions have been analyzed. A, are the conditions one and two specified for Macedonian admission, one, denomination, the firearm, Two, names negotiations indeed additional to those laid down in Article 4, Paragraph 1 of the UN Charter, or are they only part of them or contained in them? B, does the condition or do the conditions provided in Article 4, Paragraph 1 of the UN Charter form an exhaustive set of necessary and sufficient conditions for, submi for submission I beg your pardon, for admission of a state to UN membership. So read that one again. So two or B, that do the conditions provided in Article 4, Paragraph 1 of the UN Charter form an exhaustive set of necessary and sufficient conditions for admission of a state to UN membership, or can this be expanded by additional conditions? C, are the UN political organs, the Security Council and the General Assembly, legally entitled to expand the admission criteria of Article 4, Paragraph 1 of the Charter on the basis of political considerations? In order to analyze these questions, we remind that Article 4, Paragraph 1 of the UN Charter provides, quote, Membership in the United Nations is open to all other, that is, other than the original UN members. Peace-loving states which accept the obligations contained in the present charter and in the judgment of the organization are able and willing to carry all these obligations. The conditions for admission to UN membership, as expressly provided in this article, require that the applicant, one, be a state, two, be peace-loving, three, accepts the obligation of the UN Charter, four, be able to carry out these uh, obligations, and five, be willing to do so. The fulfillment of these general conditions by the applicant is a prerequisite for recommending by the Security Council and effecting by a decision of the General Assembly the admission. That is, they have to be satisfied in the judgment of the organization prior to the act of admission. The Security Council Resolution 817-1993, recommending the admission, recognized that Macedonia had fulfilled the above conditions at the time of its application to UN membership. Nevertheless, it recommended admission with replacement for the applicant official constitutional name, avoiding it in any form in the text of its recommendation. Objections from Macedonian government with regard to that unusual procedure for admission was ignored by the council and members of that body appears that didn't took into consideration that intentional omission of the constitutional and official name represent disparagement of states' dignity. 
in order to identify the legal status or the legal nature of the extraneous conditions one and two imposed on Macedonia by the Security Council Resolution 817-1993 and the General Assembly Resolution 47-225-1993, one should look first into their functional role, i.e. whether they determine the suitability of the applicant for membership. The conditions one, with respect to denomination and two, with respect to negotiations. However, are imposed as unavoidable requirements on the applicant at the moment of its admission to UN membership, affecting its national dignity and they transcend, they transcend time, the act of admission. They transcend in time the act of admission. Such requirements do not serve the purpose of criteria which, are, uh, which the applicant should fulfill prior to its admission, uh, like those in Article 4, but they are rather conditions which the applicant should accept to carry on and fulfill after its admission to membership. The strong Macedonian objection to the inclusion of such conditions in the Security Council Resolution 817-1993 was completely ignored and the admission to UN membership was subjected to their acceptance. The conditions for admission imposed on the state by the act of its admission as conditio sine qua non and which transcend that act in time cannot be evidently regarded as, regarded as part of or contained in those legally enumerated in Article 4, Paragraph 1, the fulfillment of which is required prior to the act of admission. In absence of the Institute of Conditional Admission to the United Nations membership, the external conditions 1 and 2 must be regarded as conditions transcending their cause, i.e. as being additional to those contained in Article 4, Paragraph 1. The additional character of these conditions with respect to those laid down in Article 4, Paragraph 1 is also obvious from the fact that, as it has been mentioned earlier, the resolution of the Security Council 817-1993 explicitly recognizes that the applicant satisfies the conditions for admission prescribed in Article for paragraph one and recommends admission. The very fact that the conditions one and two transcend in time the act of admission indicates that their character is not legal, but rather it is of a political nature. We shall discuss in more detail the legal consequences of these conditions somewhat later on. At this point, we would like to emphasize that the imposition of additional conditions one and two in the Security Council Resolution 817-1993 creates an internal logical inconsistency in, the, in this UN resolution. Apparently, the motivation for imposing the conditions one and two to the admission of Macedonia to UN membership was the observation by the Security Council that, quotation, a difference has arisen over the name of the state, which needs to be resolved in the interest of the maintenance of peaceful and good neighborly relations in the region. End of quote. This provision implies that the applicant state is unwilling to carry out the obligation contained in Article 2, Paragraph 4 of the Charter, which requires that the members shall refrain in their international relations from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state or in any other manner inconsistent with the purposes of the United Nations, end of quote. On the other hand, the recognition contained in the Security Council Resolution 817-1993 that the applicant state fulfills the admission criteria of Article 4, Paragraph 1 means that the Security Council affirms that the applicant state is a peace-loving state, able and willing to carry out the obligations in the char Charter, including Article 2, Paragraph 4. Therefore, the two statements in the Security Council Resolution 817-1993 are contradictory to each other. 
Additional conditions, on the other hand, were formulated as a prize, conditio sine qua non, that state had to pay for obtaining the UN membership status. The choice for UN candidate was explicitly take it or leave it, in quotation, take it or leave it, dilemma with respect to those new requirements placed in the admission process. Normally, states would reject such an offer since name of the state represent a dignity of a state and would try everything possible to avoid a situation that could entail a change uh, of that um, uh, peremptory symbol. Nevertheless, Macedonian government accepted two irrational conditions despite the national humiliation and continued to be blackmailed by hostile state during the membership in the UN, i.e. accepting discrimination. The questions B and C put forward at the beginning of this section in this chapter um, two, as indicated in the chapter one, have been answered by the advisory opinion of the International Court of Justice in the admission case. This opinion provides an interpretation of Article 4, Paragraph 1 of the Charter and has been accepted by the General Assembly. The advisory opinion states that a, quotation, member of the United Nations that is called upon by virtue of Article 4 of the Charter to pronounce itself by vote either in the Security Council or in the General Assembly on admission of a state to membership in the organization is not ju judicially entitled to make its consent dependent on conditions not expressly provided in paragraph one of that article. End of quote. This opinion of the court was based on the arguments that the UN Charter is a multilateral treaty whose provisions impose obligations on its members, that Article 4 represents a legal rule which, while it fixes the conditions for admission, determines also the reasons for which admission may be refused, that the enumeration of the conditions in Article 4, Paragraph 1, is exhaustive, since, in the opposite, it would lead to conferring upon members an indefinite and practically unlimited power of discretion in the imposition of new conditions, in which case the Article 4, Paragraph 1 would cease to be a legal norm. The conclusion of the court was that the conditions set forth, that the conditions... <clears throat> All right, that the conditions set forth in Article 4, Paragraph 1 ex are exhaustive. They're not only uh, the necess uh, they're no uh, not only the necessary, but also the sufficient conditions for admission to membership in the United Nations. As we have seen, both additional requirements one and two were political demands relating to recognition of the state or statehood on apparent conditions, sine qua non basis. This kind of individual diplomatic recognition is entirely extraneous, extraneous from the set of general legal conditions that form a norm for UN admission. Furthermore, UN as an organization is not entitled to recognize elements of the statehood of the candidate, the applicant state, but to pronounce itself whether the candidate is a state and whether it is satisfied general conditions spelled out in the Article 4, Paragraph 1 of the Charter. That was not the case with the Macedonian admission to the UN where political considerations resulted in the admission of the nameless state in the organization. Apparently, only in multi lateral organizations, Macedonia lo lost its uh, legal ID and not in bilateral relations, says Professor Dr. Igor Yanev in his paper. The court specifically addressed the question whether from the political character of the organs responsible for admission, the Security Council and the General Assembly, according to Article 4, Paragraph 2, or for the maintenance of world peace and security, Security Council, according to Article 24 of the Charter. One can derive arguments which could invalidate the exhaustive character of the conditions enumerated in Article 4, 
paragraph 1. The court rejected its possibility and held that the political character of an organ cannot release it from the observance of the treaty provisions established by the Charter when they constitute limitations on its powers or criteria for its judgment. According to court's uh, opinion, the Charter limits the freedom of political organs and no political considerations can be superimposed on or added to the organs prescribed in Article 4, Paragraph 1 that could prevent admission to membership. In case of Macedonian admission, apparently political considerations were superimposed on the Macedonian state in the form of the take it or leave it requirements that served as additional conditions for membership, entirely dependent on political recognition of its elements, of its judicial personality by another member state of the UN. These political conditions affected the fundamental moral aspects as well, and the dignity of the state and the nation, including internal public moral and beliefs of the ethnic Macedonians in the Republic of Macedonia. For most of Macedonians, the imposition of the firearm was perceived as a brutal attack to national dignity from the UN and a betrayal of Macedonian President Kiro Gligorov. The advisory opinion of the court also emphasized the functional purpose of the conditions. They serve as criteria for admission and have to be fulfilled in the judgment of the organization prior to the recommendation and the decision for admission. Further, once it has been recognized by the competent UN organs that these conditions had been fulfilled, the applicant acquires a unconditional right to UN membership. In the case of Macedonia, additional conditions actually became new political obligations of quasi-legal character. This universal and unconditional right follows from the openness to membership enshrined in Article 4, Paragraph 1, and from the universal ch character of the organization. In the words of Judge Alvarez, the exercise of this right cannot be blocked by the imposition of other conditions not expressly provided for by the Charter, by international law, or by convention, or, or any grounds of a political nature. Apparently, conditioning by recognition, political or diplomatic, of another, of another member state or absence of diplomatic relations represent additional illegal conditioning for UN admission. That became clear when it became obvious that provisional imposed denomination could not serve as an element of the judicial uh, personality of the sovereign entity as a state, as we shall elaborate in more details later, says Professor Dr. Igor. Igor Yanev. As mentioned earlier, the General Assembly, by its resolution 197, paragraph 3a of 1948, has accepted the court's interpretation of Article 4, paragraph 1 of the Charter, and recommended that each member of the Security Council and of the General Assembly, in exercising its vote on the admission of new member, should act in accordance with the foregoing opinion of the International Court of Justice. ICJ. Moreover, in the part C, D, E, F, G, H, I of the same General Assembly Resolution 197, paragraph 3 of 1948, the General Assembly has implemented the court's interpretation of Article 4, paragraph 1 of the Charter by requesting the Security Council to provide recommendations for admission of a number of states uh, to UN membership the delivery of which was blocked by certain Security Council members on the basis of arguments of political nature or absence of diplomatic relations, not strictly related to the conditions set forth in Article 4, Paragraph 1. Relevance of these cases in, is in uh, fact that Macedonia in late 90s could, through members of the UN General Assembly, request an advisory opinion here after AO from the International Court of Justice, ICJ, on legality of additional conditions and its illegal membership status in the UN. And after delivery of the AO from the court established its constitutional name, Republic of Macedonia, in the UN in General Assembly 
resolution adopting opinion of the court. In view of the court's interpretation of Article 4 of the Charter as a legal norm, which should be observed also by the UN political organs, and its acceptance by the General Assembly, the General Assembly Resolution 197, Paragraph 3A, it is obvious that the imposition of additional apparently political conditions on Macedonia for its admission to UN membership is a clear violation of Article 4, Paragraph 1 of the Charter. From the fact that the additional conditions transcend in time the act of admission with no strictly specified time limit, it follows that their imposition did not serve the purpose of admission conditions, which should be fulfilled before the act of admission, but rather a specific political purpose. This indicates that the additional conditions imposed on Macedonia for its uh, admission to UN membership have no legal character and by its, their nature are extraneous to those contained in Article 4, Paragraph 1, and by definition, apparently illegal. The violation of Article 4, Paragraph 1 of the Charter for, by the General Assembly's Resolution 47 to, slash 225, 1993 year was not a mere ultra virus act. The imposition of additional conditions to Macedonia for its uh, admission to UN membership means denial of its right to admission once it has been recognized that it fulfilled the exhaustive conditions set forth in Article 4, uh, Paragraph 1. This right is enshrined in the Article 4, Paragraph 1 itself. Membership in the United Nations is open to all other peace-loving states and is implied by the principle of universality of the United Nations organization. For the organization itself, the principle of its universality and the provision for its openness to membership create a duty to admit an applicant to UN membership when it has been recognized that it fulfills the criteria set forth in Article 4, Paragraph 1. Political conditions imposed in Macedonian case most obviously represent a disgrace in the practice of the UN Security Council, completely unaware of the first advisory opinion, opinion of the ICJ delivered in 1948. Therefore, the imposition of additional illegal conditions on a state that fulfills the prescribed admission conditions blatantly violates the basic right of that state to become uh, a member of the organization and one of the fundamental principles of the organization as well embedded in the charter. The duty of the organization to admit states that fulfill the conditions of Article 4, Paragraph 1 to UN membership without imposing additional political conditions has been recognized by the General Assembly in its Resolution 197, Paragraph 3, Part C, D, E, F, G, H, I, as mentioned earlier. The UN organization is not entitled with power to recognize a new state or revise elements of its statehood and personality, since UN is not sovereign subject, nor supranational organization. Organization is apparently not entitled to admit in its membership nameless states or entities or to revise their IDs. In conclusion, the violation of Article 4, Paragraph 1 of the Charter represent an ultra virus act of the partially illegal Security Council Resolution 817 from 1993, a resolution that serves as a legal basis for the PRESPA agreement between Greece and Macedonia of 2018. Final agreement for the settlement of the differences as described in the United Nations Security Council Resolution 817-1993 and 845-1993, the termination of the Interim Accord of 1995 and the establishment of a strategic partnership between the parties that attempts to change and regulate on external basis the national identity of Macedonia and its nationals 
contrary to the basic norms of international public law and basic human rights law. We shall end it there. We are actually halfway through um, of chapter two. We've covered two major points there. Uh, the remainder points will be done um, shortly in a separate uh, live video. I encourage you to listen to the first part of this um, series on the Macedonian question, whereby we are talking about the latest research paper titled The Prespa Agreement I call, um, as a cultural genocide of the Macedonian identity towards the termination of an illegal treaty, a paper, research paper published by AGM Kniga 2023 in Belgrade. <music> I'm grateful to you for bearing with me on this occasion. This was the second broadcast uh, of this paper uh, in which we covered um, half of chapter two. And remember, there are six chapters in this book. So we have quite a lot to cover. And uh, I uh, once again thank you for your attention please uh, if you do have any questions or comments to make uh, you're most welcome to do so we shall try and um, disseminate this um, live uh, video as uh, wide as possible uh, to reach a much wider audience about this paper and the facts and the truth contained therein so You've been listening to um, In Focus with Silvana Pavlovska. I'm looking forward to seeing you very soon again. Thank you so much for joining me. Bye-bye for now. Mm -hmm.